So because men of evil intent, men will attack you. Men will try to steal from you. Men will try to rob you. So what you need to do is have a system. Well, today we start a new series. It's entitled iTech. And we are looking at the uh, interface and engagement between the person of faith, the Christian, uh, and technology. And we'll also throw a smattering in there concerning the future. So if you want the uh, formal tagline for it, it's iTech, technology, the future, and me. And uh, the sermon today, the first sermon uh, in the series that gets us launched into this uh, thought pattern, uh, is called The Best Technology. We're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 1, so you can turn in your Bibles there if you have them, or if not, just follow on the screen um, when I do read it. The big idea for the entire sermon series, and the big idea for this specific sermon is a bit twofold. Uh, it's the same idea, uh, but this latter part of the idea finds its root in the first part, and it's this, that God is sovereign, and that any technology that proceeds from God is the best technology. And then the application, of course, is that we need to attach ourselves to the best technology and to the sovereignty of God. That's the takeaway from all of this. Um, the, we thought it um, wise to find the uh, educated opinion of someone else who's an expert in this area. And for that, we were privileged to um, have Dr. Louis, Professor Dr. Louis Fauri. Um, uh, maybe I should put it this way. The Reverend Professor Dr. Louis Fauri, who is a colleague of mine who serves within the Uniting Reformed Church denomination. Um, and he is uh, overqualified to speak on this topic. And we've done a short remote interview with him. And that has been packaged as a separate file. If you want to find the most value out of this sermon, I suggest you refer to that interview. Um, the link uh, is on our Facebook page, so please do click on that, and you'll find it on YouTube as well. Uh, a lot of the information um, that he delivers in that interview um, is information that I do not repeat here, uh, but it's an excellent pre-introduction to what I am doing in this sermon and in the series. Um, a lot of what I am saying here matches, is parallel to what he is saying, but he says it way better than I can. So please do refer to that um, as you, um, you know, listen to the sermon. Um, it's best to do it actually before you listen to me. Uh, right, Genesis 1 verses 1 to 5, and then Genesis 1 19 to 30, and then Genesis 2, 19 to 22 um, are um, the passages that we're going to look at, and then a little bit later, Genesis 11 as well. I've got three major points. I'll expand on them, and today they all start with A's. But let's look at Genesis 1, 1 to 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening. And there was morning. The first day. May God add a blessing to the public reading of his word. Pray with me before we expound on this passage and the uh, related passages. Father, we bless you and we thank you that we can come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. I want to thank you, dear Lord, that your technology of communication does not require any hardware, does not require, dear Lord Father, any wireless connection, but dear Lord Father, we are connected to you by spirit and we thank you that we can approach your throne as sons and daughters of the Most High God at any time and with any concern we have on our heart. We also know, dear Lord, that it is great joy that we can enter into your presence and commune and speak with you because you just love spending time with your children. And dear Lord, Father, may we love spending time with you, even time listening to your word, listening to your word being expounded, preached, and taught. And I pray, dear Lord, Father, that you continue in Jesus' name to make yourself known even through this preaching product. Bless all those who hear it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Genesis 1 to 5, it's the 
uh, first few verses um, of God's making himself known, and he makes himself known as the creator God. Just uh, two thoughts of devotional uh, value for you before we get into our three major points. It says, in the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The first thing that is established as part almost of the nature of verses 1 and 2 is, yes, God is creator, but also that God is present. The second uh, uh, point that I want to make is, is deeply rooted in this point, again, um, but l- let me just camp out here for an extra few seconds. That Psalm 118 verse 6 says that uh, God will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13 emphasizes that point once again in the New Testament. And it's this idea that no matter who we are, no matter what we have done, that if we are submitted to Christ, imperfect as we are in our discipling and discipleship, imperfect as we are in our relational abilities, and imperfect as we are in our ministerial efforts of evangelism and others, we are a people who are never left to our own devices by God, unless, of course, we proclaim it and we so choose it. But for those of us imperfect as we are, fallen as we are, mistake-ridden as we are, if you want to be with Christ and with God, He will cover your sin, He will overlook your imperfections, and He will hold you in the center of your hand and never let go. He's there. Even in this uh, unformed mass that is not yet creation, it's at the very beginning stages of this creation, it says here, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and now it explains how the earth was formless and empty. So at this part in the process, the earth is still being formed, it is a mass of matter, but it's not what we understand it to be today or even a few thousand years ago. It is formless, and God is hovering there. I want you to walk away from the very beginning of the sermon with the assurance that if you love Jesus but are imperfect, there's this almost imperfect duality, imperfection and the perfect. And the perfect is willing to spend time with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you, which is my second point, by the way, that it is possible um, for the imperfect to dwell with the perfect and vice versa. Uh, Sin cannot enter, as you do know. Uh, into the area of perfection, because the moment it enters, it desanctifies the entire space um, and reduces which was perfect. If it attaches it to it and becomes one with it, it therefore makes it imperfect. Except when it comes to God. If he attaches himself, the perfect, to the imperfect, instead of being brought down to the level of imperfection, he raises that which is imperfect to the level of perfection. And this is what God is doing here. For those who have faith, for those who would believe, and for those who would submit to the sovereignty of God in their lives and all over creation, as is reality, so you're simply agreeing with reality when you proclaim that God is sovereign, then God is saying, I will attach myself to you, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And despite all your imperfections, I'm going to raise you to perfect. That's the greatest technology known to man, my brother, my sister, my friend in Christ. I want you to know that technology is supposed to improve the lot of man, improve the experience of man, and is supposed to take mankind into a place of greater perfection. And so, you know, in a, a Tim Challies, in his book Next, uh, puts it this way. He says that technology, when it is entered into with a pure mind and a pure spirit and with great intentions, um, accesses the power of the imago Dei, the image of God. In other words, we are acting as if uh, God were acting because God is a creative God. He creates things from pure intent and He does it so with a, a perfect sanctification and a purity of heart that we can only dream of and will achieve on that day when He comes to fetch His bride. So when we create, it's a good thing, it's part of the Imago Day. We, we are imitating our God, the Creator God. But we, of course, are fallen. And there was no need, um, you know, 
for uh, abattoirs and slaughterhouses and so forth. Uh, this is relevant for a bit later. Remember this in the back of your mind. Um, but after the fall, there was a need for those things. Right? There, was a, there was no need for weaponry, guns and spears and shields and tanks today and all the type of uh, military hardware that we have today, all the systems of military, they're all technology. Uh, but in a fallen world, to protect yourself, you actually need that type of technology. And so technology is supposed to have a sanctifying effect, not only for the individual, and uh, a perfecting effect, not only for the individual, but it's also supposed to have um, a sanctifying and perfecting effect for the community of humanity. And so God wants you to understand that you are never left alone by him. And this duality, and there's quite a bit of duality just in this first two verses. Um, there's heaven and earth. There is formless and empty, but the process of becoming whole. Um, there is the spirit of God, which is perfect and incomplete, hovering over that which is incomplete. It's possible to have a duality of intention, which is perfect. I want to be with God and have a reality where there are many areas in my life that are not quite there yet. It's formless, it's chaotic, it's uh, unprocessed. And God is hovering there and he says, don't worry. I'm in the process of creating and transforming you into that which you should be. He says, never leave me nor forsake me because I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So that's some. Um, Devotional application right from the first two verses over there, and the technology of communication, the technology of the creation of God is the best. So that leads me to my first major point, and it's this, that God's technology is A-list. In other words, it's the best. You cannot get better than this. So let's look at these first uh, three verses, uh, th first five verses again in Genesis, and let's just uh, see what it has to say to us in this regard. Um, the, the first thing is this, that God has created everything. But let's break that down a little bit more. So God has created matter, um, the, 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 the basis for every manifested object that came out of his mouth. Um, then out of that he creates the earth, of course, the pinnacle of that earth being mankind. And then God also creates systems of technology to bless, maintain, and elevate all of creation, but specifically mankind as well. And so let me just say this as a sub-point very quickly, that the health of humanity di directly relates to the health of our planet, directly relates to the health of broader creation, the animal kingdom, the beastly kingdom, the insect kingdom, the flora and fauna kingdom, um, the health of humanity. Uh, and the status of sanctification of humanity directly relates to the status and sanctification and the health of all creation. And so, here are some things that God puts in place, technologies, to bless humanity. Uh, so, we understand that His creation is a list. All of um, man's technology seeks to mimic and seeks to get to the creativity and the power of God's creation. So let me give you an example. Um, my hand is somehow injured, and they have to amputate it. And there is technology around now, it's not perfect yet. Um, we, in the olden days, they used to just put a little hook on it. Uh, then it developed to a, um, a clamp with a system of pulleys. Um, and then it um, uh, now is at the place where they can connect a mechanical man-made device, somehow sync it to your nerve endings, and get it to function like a normal hand. I suppose in the next few decades, maybe even sooner, uh, people will have limbs as functioning prosthetics where one is unable to tell the difference between a flesh and bone hand or versus a metal or some type of steel compound um, covered in synthetic flesh hand. Um, we, we are going there. But the, the aim is always to kind of replicate what God has already done. We, we, we can't produce life, and when we do, we fail and we create monsters. Um, 
and, and aberrations, um, but our technology tries to mimic the greatest technology of all, which is what God has created, the created order. Now, which leads me to this A-list technology. So God creates the hardware, but now he's also creating the systems. Refer to Dr. Fourier's definition of technology. Not only hardware, it also is systems that drives the hardware. So the first thing that God does in these first five verses is he moves from chaos to order. He gives us order, which are systems of proper and optimum functioning. And this order is further defined in the rest of the Bible for us. And a prime amongst that order is that we need to recognize God, diligently search for God, and then once we find Him and He recognizes us, we must submit to this God. That's the order. He also defines orders, technologies, systems of technology for everything else. He says, our man should relate to a woman. How parents should relate to their children and vice versa. How Christians and people of faith must relate to society at large. How leaders must relate um, to uh, those that they lead. How followers or citizenry should relate to their leaders in government, whether they are Christians or not. He provides order, and this order must be understood as systems of proper and optimum function. You could function outside of the order of God. But you do so to your own peril, and you do so with the effects of negativity and aberration that will be your lot if you do do so. Secondly, um, God gives a, um, a, an economy to it as well. Um, listen to Genesis 1, 29 to 30. It says this, Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And so here the Lord uh, gives... Um, the, um, uh, what he has created as the substance for our sustenance. He says, every green plant that has seed in it, I give it for food to you. Now, a couple of thoughts here very quickly. So this is God's economy. Firstly, God's economy is sustainable, seed-bearing plants. Um, there's an ecosystem, you know, bird flies, um, eats seeds, it goes through its digestive system, um, the, um, the, uh, the, the bird then uh, drops those seeds uh, into the ground and it germinates and it produces uh, a new plant of seed-producing plants. It's always sustainable. If we only function in consumerism, we only function in destroying and this unhealthy attitude of what we think is dominance and not what God has called us to dominion, uh, complete difference between dominance and dominion, uh, then uh, we're never going to reproduce. It's not going to be a, an economy that is self-sustaining, and uh, we need to be very careful about that. Uh, but then also, uh, this economy is not only self-sustaining, this economy also understands that it's here to bless you and everyone else, even creation. I find it interesting. And to all the people who are living the vegan lifestyle or trying to, just by the way, I love my meat. And um, I don't know, I've prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, I know we're not going to eat any meat. There will be no slaughtering in heaven or the new earth. Um, but could there please be a lamb tree? Possibly a beef tree. I would really appreciate that. Uh, and considering where technology is going these days, where you can buy plant-based meat, I'm guessing that if the technology is going up to the best technology, which is God, somewhere in heaven, there is a tree. Uh, that produces, you know, a grade filet mignon, my favorite. Anyway, point is, brothers and sisters, that there's an economy of God. There's an order, there's an economy, and then there's also a relationship economy that God creates. Um, so, uh, listen to Genesis 2. Now, the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, dominion. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. 
So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. So there is an order. It's part of God's ultimate technology. There is an economy. It's part of God's ultimate technology. It's supposed to bless you and not oppress you. Uh, there is a relationship order that God also brings across. And this relationship order, again, it, it refers to government, it refers to general society, and it also refers to the minute, very specific relationships between individuals and its various classes. Um, here it's speaking about Adam and Eve. And I, I want you to first see, of course, a number of things, but Adam first has a relationship with the broader order of God before he has a specific relationship with another individual, which is Eve. Um, and that's always a healthy point. Uh, that you must be in good standing with what is uh, before you get into a romantic, lifelong, forever relationship with what could be. And to everyone that's um, listening and you happen to be married, please take this into consideration. And especially for those who are not yet married, listen with a very keen interest to this point. But God creates Adam for Eve and he creates Eve for Adam. Uh, and I know what some of you are thinking, well, you know, obviously God created Eve for Adam because she comes from him. Therefore, uh, you know, it, 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 he didn't create him for one another. Well, he certainly did. Uh, if that were the case, then we could say it's unfair that Adam and Eve, or Adam specifically, is created after all uh, the beastly kingdoms, flora and fauna kingdoms, and so forth. Um, uh, but yet, Adam has dominion and gets to name them. Um, uh, Eve could quite easily say, well, the only reason God created you was so that I could be here. And it would be consistent with that type of thinking. The point is that God has created creation to interweave, to interrelate, and to bless one another. There is a system of order. There is a system of honor. But it is all weaved into a harmonious community which will be fully realized in the new earth and the new heaven. But we try and replicate that today. Your will on earth as it is in heaven. So Christians, we are called to recognize that God's technology is the best. We also call to recognize that technology in a fallen world places the burden on improving the lot um, and the pleasure um, uh, and solving the problems for mankind, um, which only a fallen world demands, not a perfect world. Um, and we also understand that God's also given us an economy uh, of systems, and that's from chaos to order, um, that is uh, from lack to an economy that provides for everyone, and that is from relationships that are often uh, 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 functioning in ridicule and conflict to relationships uh, where we all live for one another despite the very specific orders that exist. So, number one, God's technology is A-list. Let's look at man's technology. It's related to the same scriptures, but this is just the converse. And man's technology is artificial. And what I mean by that, I've covered this already, is that man's technology seeks to mimic or imitate God's technology. There is none of man's technology which has uh, uh, even come close to that which God has created. So let me give you an example. Uh, we talk about rockets um, that can go into space and all of these type of things and launch itself, um, which seems impressive to us, um, but doesn't come close to the type of shooting stars which launch itself from its own natural DNA with gases that create momentum and so forth. Um, and we see them as beautiful falling stars in our own atmosphere. Uh, we, we haven't created anything close to that type of raw natural power um, and that can move through space for sometimes thousands of years before they burn out. Um, th th there is, um, uh, we, we can harness the power of nature and we can compound it by connecting it with other uh, pieces of nature and turn it into new chemical products that can enhance um, uh, the medicinal value of that particular medicinal product. Um, and, and that's what we can do. 
But I, you know, I, I take, for example, not only I look at a falling star, but I also look at things like um, something like aloe vera. I've got uh, aloe vera plant in my yard, and um, I'm fully aware of its um, uh, medicinal benefits. And it, it's so much. I mean, uh, the entire sermon, if I just went down the list of all the benefits of uh, aloe vera, succulent leaf, and what it does fr from blood pressure uh, to sugar diabetes, to skin ailments and inflammation, um, this, uh, to detoxifying your system, and all of the stuff in between, this plant is amazing. And there are so many other plants like it, some of them we haven't even discovered yet, they're all called super plants, uh, but they are absolutely amazing technologies created by God the Father. We use them, and we can also uh, enhance them in combination with other things. Um, to, just to get almost, not facetious, but almost extremely basic, the technology of water and air, our environment. Um, without that, we are literally left without life. We are dead. And yet we can't create water. Uh, we've got machines these days that can harness moisture out of the air and then turn it into water in a machine. But that's harnessing water in vapor form that's in our atmosphere and turning it then into a liquid form of water. But we cannot create water. Uh, and, and people are trying, and they're trying to get the technology to get there, but um, we, we, we probably never will. And um, the, 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 the technology of God is just so far ahead of man's technology. So man's technology is artificial. In other words, it doesn't mean it's not great. It doesn't mean it can't bless you and it can't help you. And I'll speak more about this in next week's sermon. Uh, but it, it mimics what God tries to do, and we just don't have the capacity to do what God can do. And then number three, man's technology has an aim. Um, and so there are a few positive aims, again referred to, um, to the good professor in the interview that we've attached to this as a separate file. Uh, again, check it on Facebook or on YouTube. Um, but here are some aims. These four aims I'd just like to read to you. These are the positive aims. This is by DJ Wardinsky, one of the technology writers I follow. He's, uh, he writes predominantly for Brainspire. Check them out if you're that way inclined. And uh, these are the four areas that he sees technology's aims being materialized in a positive way. And the first one is technology boosts business. I mean, just 30 years ago, um, when we still had dial-up internet in its infancy and so forth, no one could have understood that entire economies would be created or changed by this new technology. That online stores, like here in South Africa, Loot, Kalahari, Take A Lot, uh, and worldwide, Amazon, Alibaba, and so forth, these entire markets would be created in a digital online fashion that never existed before, and in fact, they would overtake the world eventually. The richest man in the world today is the owner and founder of Amazon.com, only not because he sells things on there, because he owns the very market, was one of the first to get in on the deal. So technology boosts business. Also, if you think of um, uh, the um, T-Model Ford when it was created, uh, roads were not created yet, tires were not created yet, uh, certain chemical uh, plastic compounds were not created yet to aid in the manufacturing and the development of the motor vehicle. And so entire industries uh, were started by that one technological advance. Entire uh, 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 economies are built around car manufacturing, then oil mining uh, for the fuel for these cars and so forth. Just by the way, and I'll talk about the future again, um, in weeks to come, uh, but it is my prediction that electric cars are going to revolutionize the automobile industry, and if I live for the average of 70 years, um, that by the time I get 70, I think that most people in first world countries, maybe even in a developing economy like South Africa and Africa, the majority of cars would be electric cars. And um, if you are wise, you might want to be looking at preparing for that and getting in on it at its beginning stages. So, technology boosts business, technology advances education. We've seen that during COVID-19, won't spend too much time on that. Number three, technology smoothens communication. Cell phones, hello. iPhone, toot toot, hello. We could not do that before. You are now reachable and can reach people at any place, at any time, 
because of satellite technology, uh, because of the power in a little console that we call a cell phone, and it's got so much processing power that even the biggest computers 40, 50 years ago could never imagine that we'd achieve this. Number four, technology also makes everyday life better. Vacuum cleaning, that's all I say. Dishwasher, that's all I say. So, those are the positive effects by uh, Wodinsky. And there's a few more, of course, but they would all fall into those four categories. The Tower of Babel is an interesting story about the negative effects about man's technology. And I want to just park here for a few moments very quickly. Uh, you might find what I'm about to say here quite interesting. So let's read Genesis chapter uh, 11, and we're reading the first eight verses. It says, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. It's a new technology, it's a new system. They knew about bricks, uh, but now they want to bake them, not just bake them, they want to bake them thoroughly. So it, it appears that probably they put it in a furnace and not just put it out into the sun to bake. They used brick instead of stone. In other words, <laughs> it seems the predominant uh, uh, construction method would be to cut stone out of mountains or uh, rock edifices and so forth and then use that to build. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So look at the purpose of technology. We already said that if it is sanctified um, and if it is well-intentioned and pure of heart, then technology will bless man and will eliminate some of the effects and the demands that the fall has brought upon humanity. All right. So because men of evil intent, men will attack you. Men will try to steal from you. Men will try to rob you. So what you need to do is have a system that can defend you. Uh, and so there will be systems uh, of technology. But then there's also hardware, like certain weaponry that you might have, a gun or a baseball bat or whatever the story might be, uh, to help defend yourself. Those weapons are only for defense and not for offense. But because there are people who use it defensively, you need it defensively. But here we see uh, that the uh, intention is to create a name for themselves and to reach God and be equal with God, which is going right back to Genesis chapter 2, which is the fall. So they want to make a name for themselves. Um, and then verse 5, it says, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. So notice here, they want to build a tower to be equal with God, and they want to build a city, a town, a community that didn't need God. A new town. And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. The issue here is not the end physical goal, which is building the tower. And the issue is not the end goal of creating a town. Th those are for want of a better term, neutral ideals, nothing wrong with that. But the issue is the motivation behind it. We want to be equal to God and we want to remove God from our economy. We also want a town where uh, there is a sense of community without God at the center of it and without God's order at the center. We want a new world order rooted in humanism, the values that come from humanity with us as the creator, therefore the sovereign and the authority over it. And so God is saying, if this is the aim that you want to achieve, I need to stop the hardware so that you get the idea of the software going errant. So come let us go down, he says, the triune God, come let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building that city. That is why it is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So, number one from the story of Babel, that man's technology has an aim and the positive aim is to increase the, the, uh, the pleasure and the potentials of humanity and stop the effects of the fall. But the negative effects is we want to replace God and we want to remove God from our human existence. So we want to be similar to him. Um, I've referred to him in the past, I refer him to him again, uh, Watchman Nee. 
um, wrote a book called The Latent Power of the Soul, and in this he delineates the fact that uh, man must have had tremendous power, um, obviously pre-fall, but also post-fall. And so here's how the theory goes. First of all, can you imagine the type of technology and the tools that were required? And if the tools were created, that means the prowess and the capabilities of those who uh, designed the tools and then engineered those tools must have been tremendous. So this is what Watchman Nee says, and by extension alludes to, which I'm putting into words today, is that just as the average age of each generation since Adam went down, generation by generation, Adam lived 900 plus years, Matul is 967, Adam was 930 odd, um, with each succeeding generation living a few decades less on average, maybe a century less on average to the point where the average lifespan becomes uh, 70 years old with a maximum of 120, which is basically where we are right now. And so the, um, uh, not only did the ability to live long get decreased, but the other physical ability and prowess has also decreased, which means that they were able to do things that could only blow our minds, which includes building things like the Tower of Babel and even building things like the pyramids in Egypt, uh, which is an engineering almost impossibility. Their engineers today still wonder how they did it with such accuracy. Well, I suspect, like Watchman Nee says, that humanity had abilities uh, that we can't imagine. Uh, we are rapidly catching up to those abilities but not because an increase in our own natural ability in this age of humanity, um, but because we are able to use time to our advantage. And so one person creates a technology in this uh, epoch of time, and in the next epoch or age, I come along and I use that information and improve on it. And if you do that long enough, time will always overcome talent. And so we... <laughs> Uh, we, we understand that they had tremendous ability here, but the talent was against God and wanted to replace God. Let's end here. The best technology is God's technology, and God is sovereign. And I want every Christian and every person even who is listening to this message to walk away with us. Just by the way, this is a preaching sermon this is also a teaching, preaching. And I say that with a purpose because the aim of preaching is always to elicit a transforming response, repentance, uh, growth, submission. Uh, a teaching really is giving you the information and you do with it what you will. Uh, I, I just don't want you to receive teaching and information. What I do want you to do is be transformed by the power of God's Word. So what is the call to action here? The call to action is to recognize that God is sovereign that you're a creative God, a creative man, uh, created by a creative God, uh, and you must function in the image of God, the Imago Dei. But it starts with you acknowledging that God is creator and that he is sovereign, and that you've got a creative part to play in finding solutions for this world. I call it this. Uh, a few years ago, I had a consultancy called Cornelius Consultants, and my tagline was that I am a solutions architect to the problems of humanity and the workspace. We, we need more people to be solutions architects, using their God-given creativity, recognizing that there are negative effects of technology. But as Christians, we will invent, we will create systems and hardware, software and hardware, so that humanity can progress and be blessed, and we do so all to the glory of God. I'm going to pray for you and ask God that he injects you with his power, with his grace, with his mercy, with his presence, and releases in you a creative streak in whichever genre or subspace of human activity and thinking you function in, but that you do so to the sovereignty and to the glory of God. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that you have created us as creative beings. And dear Lord, Father, we operate in the image of God that um, you have placed upon us and in us, that we would also invent and create. And I pray, dear Lord, Father, that you would allow us to do so, to assist humanity to achieve its goals of pleasure and promise and potential. But I also pray, dear Lord, Father, that you give us the ability to witness for you and to use our creativity as a wonderful prophetic uh, uh, testimony.
to our God, Jesus Christ. For those who don't know you, dear Lord Father, may they come to know you. May they serve you radically. And may they, be, may they be set free of the imperfections of the fall thrust upon all those born into this earth. So that we, dear Lord Father, might spend eternity with you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.